Hi, Mary. Welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. I am excited to get to know you a little bit better. I first um, learned about your story through the Next Avenues uh, Influencers on Aging for 2021. So first of all, congratulations on being recognized for making waves. Thank you very much. So you just inspired me to want to learn more about you and your story. And of course, I always want to know how caregivers are also infusing their self-care into their life. Um, but um, let's just first start with your caregiving story. How did you find yourself in this primary caregiving role that you probably didn't want? My husband was diagnosed, um, this May will be nine years ago. Um, he was 59 years old and he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Young. So it was a very life-changing uh, day, obviously. And um, as he slowly declined, my role as caregiver has certainly um, obviously increased. Um, two years ago, um, actually July will be three years ago, I placed him in a memory care center. Steve was very, very social. He was a salesman um, mm -hmm. by trade. So um, he knew how to make friends and build relationships, which made him very, very good at his job. He sold Florida's natural orange juice. So would go around the country selling Florida orange juice and made friends all along the way. And I thought I was doing the right thing by keeping him at home. I thought that was the best level of care um, until I realized that locking him in the house and not giving him purpose and um, socialization was not the right answer. So I placed him uh, July of 2019 in a memory care center and he thrived absolutely loved it. They gave him a seat at the front desk. He had a name tag with his name on it. He thought he worked there and God. hugged everybody that walked in the door, whether it was family members or the UPS guy. I mean, he was the official greeter and I would go see him in the evenings. I'm nine years younger than him. So I'm working and um, I'm actually a patient advocate by trade. Okay. Um, I, I started a company so I could be home with him um, doing medical billing adv advocacy. And so I would work, then go see him um, in the evenings, getting ready for bed um, and really leave as he was drifting off to sleep. So it was a really great way for both of us to end every day. I love that. You know, it's so much of what you said kind of triggered some things for me. Um, one is my husband is in sales and he's in beverage business. He sells BioLite, which is an electrolyte drink for um, dehydration, but was years in the alcohol business. And so when you're talking about he's in sales, my husband is always on the phone. He's always connecting with people and he, everyone he goes out and about and people know who he is. Um, I imagine that Steve is like the mayor of the assisted living. Fact, they call him the mayor. It's funny. Yes. That's exactly what they call him. They call him the mayor of, of yeah. The I person. think that's great. And my, you know, we had tried to convince um, my, my parents, you know, of course it's, it's their decision ultimately, but they, you know, refuse to explore that as a couple, the assisted living situation. And I always, always said that my dad would have been the mayor at the assisted living because he was a, you know, life is a contact sport. He had always told all of us. So, um, but my mom was really the one that was like, no, she was, a home, you know, but of a homebody. Um, and I think it would have been a different situation had they gone to, in together and, and he would have known what everybody did and, and, um, you know, consuming he, he had his cognitive capacities, but I love that, you know, it, everybody's situation is different and we all have to kind of see what, what the right fit is for our situation. And I'm sure that was a difficult decision for you, but, um, you also got to have a bit of your, bit of your life back and, and your, your dreams. Everything changed. I mean, it was so, when he was diagnosed, I mean, he only was able, he worked another year. And then he had to go on disability. I mean, the logistics of sales, you know, shipments and product and quantities and all of those kinds of things became very, very difficult for him. And so it changed our whole world in terms of financial um, plans, that sort of thing, you know, that he was going to be working for another seven or eight years was our plan. And all of that changed. And so it was really, um, it was it was really a very difficult decision to make. Um, obviously there's expense involved. We do not have long-term care insurance. So yeah. it was gonna be, you know, something that was gonna be financially um, difficult as well. But I really, I really learned um, when I would come home from work, he would be furious. He had been locked in this house with a, with a caregiver, with a CNA 
all day long. And we had literally deadbolts on the door. He was exit seeking. And so, I mean, literally locked in the house. And when I got home, he was a caged animal. And I knew that he did not have quality of life. I knew that this was not the right answer. And, and I actually read a book that says, that, that in, really kind of gave the, the background of saying that we all need purpose and we all need um, socialization. We need to be around other people and we need to have that community, that feeling of community to feel good about our lives. And even patients with dementia need that as well. And I, that was really sort of the deciding factor for me that I felt like this was the right thing to do for him um, and, and for us, because then it gave me the opportunity to go in and be his wife, to get him ready for bed. I mean, never did I lay in bed and watch TV with him, right? And it, as we're in our daily lives, I'm in the kitchen, I'm doing things and, you know, but I really got an opportunity. It was a great way for me to sit with him and just be with him at the end of every day. Uh -huh. um, and it was, it was really a good way for both of us to end the day. And it was working very, very well, of course, until COVID hit. Yes. Yes, yes. I um I forgot to do the caregiver jar. I want to hear about the COVID situation, okay. but I think this might be a good break to just kind of get your thoughts on um some inspiration from the caregiver jar. It says, Mary, a person has two hands, one for helping herself or himself, and the other other for helping others. So I think that kind of relates to what you were sharing about how we all need a sense of purpose, really. It does. And I, and I, and I think about that. I, I've really been a caregiver my whole life. Um, I lost my parents young. I was 17 when my father died. I was 29 when my mother died. And um, we took care of, before my mother died, we took care of several family members, my grandmother, my godmother with hospice. I mean, we, I've been caring for people in, in a caregiving role um, my whole entire life. And so I do believe that that other hand, I mean, we're in my family, my mother, we never thought about doing anything different. We never thought mm -hmm. about not being there to help the, our loved ones in the last stages of their life. That, that thought never crossed my mind. And we actually ended up, my mother died of pancreatic cancer and, you know, doing the same for her um, really sort of set the stage for me as always having that helping hand um, to help others when they needed it most. And there's a great satisfaction that comes with that. And I, it's, it's one of the things that I preach now to caregivers is that this is such an exhausting job. Um, but when all is said and done, there, there's a great deal of pride and satisfaction and value to your life that comes with knowing that you were there for somebody when they needed you the most. It's so true. It's so true. Well, we left people hanging with your story on the on the COVID situation. So yes, and you would put you had put Stephen, um, got him all situated. Things were rolling along. You were getting into your groove, and then March um, twenty twenty happened, and and kind of hit the fan. So talk us through what that was like. I went to see him, put him down um, to bed. He went to sleep on March the eleventh, and they called me March the twelfth and said you can't come back. And I immediately said, yeah, that's not gonna work for me. We're gonna have to figure something else out. And I called the executive director and said, I mean, there's gotta be something we can do. Um, can I volunteer? Can I get a job? Can I do any, I mean, what can I do? And she said, let's just wait and see what happens. I mean, you know, it's the 15 days right. below the curve or whatever it was. And, and you know, we, yeah, we, th this is just gonna be temporary. Let's see what happens. And when the days turned to weeks and the weeks turned to months, I, I started getting vocal. And I started emailing the governor and my local media, uh, my local politicians um, saying, this is not working. Steve is, is um, I mean, literally cognitively, somebody asked me not long ago, how does he feel about being vaccinated? I, he doesn't know that there was a virus. He has no idea um, what's happening out in the outside world. He's, he's very vocal in the sense that he speaks a lot, but I can't understand anything that he says. So there is no conversation. So you know, FaceTime, we did two window visits that were disaster. He cried the entire time. There was no way for me to explain to him or for him to understand why we were doing this. Um, I mean, he knew me being with him. He knew me putting him to bed. He knew me holding his hand and rubbing his back um, and giving him a hug. He didn't know any of this other stuff. He would kiss the iPad because he just didn't understand what was happening. And so I finally got the attention of some local media um, in Jacksonville. Um, the station here picked up the story and slowly got the attention of the governor. He mentioned me twice in uh, two different news conferences. So I knew I was getting closer. 
Um, and eventually he agreed to meet with me. So in July um, of 2020, I met with him and he appointed me to a task force, um, his Florida task force to reopen long-term care facilities. And um, on September the 1st, he, um, he accepted the task force recommendation. I was very adamant about touching. Um, we had the Surgeon General, Florida Surgeon General, the head of the Agency for Healthcare Administration, head of Elder Affairs, some um, lobbyists, the Healthcare Association, um, uh, nursing home lobbyists were, a couple of those were on there. And, and they were fine with letting us in, but they weren't gonna let us touch. And I mean, literally I, you know, slammed my hand down on my desk. We were uh, over Zoom, meeting over Zoom. And I said, I mean, that's a deal breaker for me. We have to be able to touch. Oh, I left out the most important part though, didn't I? I got a job, they gave me a job. Yes, <laughs> that's yes, how when that came in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that, I forgot that part. Yes, so eventually when the news stories started going, um, spreading, um, the facility, my husband's facility is based out of North Carolina and they called me and offered me a job. So I'm sure they were like, what can we do to shut this woman up? That's exactly what yeah. happened. And I don't really believe they thought I would take it um, because it was a dishwasher. So on July the 3rd, I started washing dishes and that's really how the governor, you know, it sort of got, that story went viral, like crazy viral. Yeah, like she's so adamant about this. She's going to wash dishes for right. minimum wage or whatever you were paid. Right, right exactly, right. And so I, my biggest fear was that I was going to miss this window of opportunity. I've said all along, what are we saving him for or from, right? I mean, he's going to die. This is a fatal illness. And so I'm missing today is his best day. And right. when you lock me out from him today, I'm missing his best day. I don't need to be with him when he doesn't know me, when he doesn't remember me, when he isn't, you know, getting out of bed anymore. I need to be with him today. And so my biggest fear hour, is- You know, sands for the hourglass, like you, the end is imminent. Correct. And, and I don't need to save him so that a year from now I can be with him. I, he's not gonna know me in, 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 in yeah, some period probably. of time. Yeah. So my feeling was, you know, I've got to get with him. I promised him on the day he was diagnosed, the day they actually said the A word, which took a little while before when, when we talked to them about, he was struggling with work. His doctor said, his neurologist said, you have Alzheimer's, you need to go on long-term disability. Mm -hmm. I can, we can write that letter. We can get that done. And I, I, that was the day they actually said the A word. And, um, and I promised him on that day that I would never leave his side, that he would never be alone on this journey, that I would walk with him every single day and hold his hand every single day. And for 114 days, I was not able to do that. But when I went back after my first shift and I walked into his room, um, his back was to me when I walked in the door. And when he turned around, the first thing he said was Mary. Ah. So um, it's still, I, I get, literally get choked up about it. Even It's okay, now. Mary, you've got me. I'm all <laughs> choked up over here, so no worries. We're real people. And I say he didn't, he, I wasn't too late. I got back to him in time for him to still know me and, and, and recognize me. So ah. then, the, then, then the story went viral. Then the governor appointed me to the task force. Then we got in. And my argument to them was, why am I allowed to touch him as a dishwasher, but I'm not allowed to touch him as his wife? I can do the same things. I can take the same precautions. I can, it doesn't make any sense. And the governor, thank God in Florida said, yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Well, and you were in the right state as well. I mean, 100%, 100% yes. that he knew that this was, I mean, you know, we understand why the lockdown happened. We certainly, it was done with the best of intentions and, and none of us who have been involved in this believe that there was ever, you know, it, it, we just didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. Mm -hmm. But we do know now, you know, we certainly understand that COVID kills, but we do now know that isolation kills too. Mm -hmm. And there are many tens of thousands, maybe more people died alone um, without their loved ones with them because we were not allowed to go in even, you know, yes. in a full hazmat suit. I mean, that's what I said at the beginning. I'll wear a hazmat suit. I don't care what you want me to wear but I need to get to him. I have to touch him. I have to hug him. I have to rub his back. So that got me in and that got the everybody else in September 1st for the state of Florida. Um, everybody else was allowed in. Now it's been a struggle. It's, it's the, the, the facilities have not opened their doors wide open. We've had a lot of people who in fact kept their doors 
um, closed when they shouldn't have. And so it's been an ongoing battle to educate. I mean, my mantra, we started a Facebook group. My group is called Caregivers for Compromise because isolation kills too. Yeah. We have a national group. We have a group in every single state because every state. I was going to ask. I know there's one in Georgia with like, um, you know, one and a half um, or 1500 or so folks in it that I've uh, followed. Um, but I think that's what, how do you administer all these groups? Well, it's, it, I have leaders that have stepped up in the most active ones. Okay. In the Texas group, for example, um, Mary Nichols leads that group. These are just volunteers that found the caregivers for compromise that saw our, our, the viral story. Um, and Mary Nichols took over in Texas. She has since gotten essential caregiver, um, bill passed. And in November, the state of Texas actually added essential long-term care residents have a constitutional right to an essential caregiver that will always be allowed to visit. It is now a part, it's an amendment to the Texas constitution. That's so right. pretty, pretty amazing. Some of the things that we're doing, we have a federal bill that we are working on nationally. HR 3733 is a essential caregiver bill that we're trying to get um, passed on the federal level. But each state needs one too. The federal level covers Medicare, Medicaid facilities, mm -hmm. facilities that take federal dollars. My husband's facility does not take federal dollars. So I need a state law that will fill in the cracks there that say that we have a right as an essential caregiver to go in. All we have to do is provide support. We don't have to do activities of daily living. There isn't any work involved if we so choose. Most of us do as caregivers, you know, you go in there, if Steve hasn't been shaved, if he, I help oh, him yeah. with his teeth. I mean, all the sleep apnea machines, restock the pads, right. by arms. I did it all too, yep. Right, you do whatever needs to be done, but it isn't required of us. Just emotional support is all that would be, that's, that's actually necessary to be considered an essential caregiver. And we, it, it gives us two hours per day minimum every day to go in following the same safety guidelines as the staff. So, so you're saying this is the, this is the federal that, that would, would happen, um, but then each state, maybe explain that to me again. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. The, the federal bill so that it covers all facilities, nursing homes in particular, um, that are um, federally funded, that receive Medicare and Medicaid okay. dollars. So that's yeah. the federal. But for things like my husband's facility that does not accept federal dollars, we need a yes. state law that would be applicable to them. Is your private pay or yes, yes. So exactly, which my mom wants as well. We want the state to govern that saying that we have a right because here's the thing, they're shutting down again. They're shutting down right now. We have facilities in the state of Florida that are shutting right now all across the country that are shutting down because of this new variant. So you're not allowed to do that. The CMS guidelines says that we have full visitation right now and that we have found across the board that no, very little, in Texas, I can tell you there was one case when they started allowing essential caregivers in, we have one recorded case of a family member bringing the, the virus into the facility. In Florida, we do not have a single documented case of any, we do not know of anybody that brought it in. We have a vested interest to keep these Of course. Safe. And, and the bottom line is the lockdown, it didn't work. It didn't keep the virus out of the facilities. No. Um, so it wasn't successful. So we think we can do this in a safer way. We think that we are responsible. Um, and there are, there are things in this legislation that says, if you're not responsible, if you refuse to follow the safety protocols, then the facilities do have a way to, to file a complaint about that. And you don't get to go in. I mean, we want our people to follow the rules. We want our people to be safe. Um, and there is an out for the facilities if in case that is not happening and they need some sort of, um, you know, uh, back, um, some sort of rule that says that, that they can remove us if we're not going to follow the rules. And we're fine with that because we educate. My mantra on the Facebook group is educate yourself so that you can educate them. Mm. All of these facilities, because they come in every shape and size, you know, from a mom and pop family owned operation to these huge conglomerate corporations that own thousands of facilities. Um, we have found that if you take the guidelines and we spend a lot of time educating our groups um, on our Facebook groups, highlight the rules, you take them to the, to the director and you say, you're not following these rules. Here they are in writing. Please don't make me file a complaint to blank. In Florida, it's ACA, the Agency for Healthcare Administration. So we believe that um, educating ourselves, making ourselves an expert, and that's what I'm now teaching to caregivers. Yes. Is 
you have to boldly advocate. You have to be confident in what you're fighting for because if you don't do it, you're not going to get what is rightfully ours. And that is the right to go in and hug and be with our loved ones. What do you say to the people, well, two questions to this, Mary. What, I don't know if this is gonna open a can of worms, but does the federal um, does the federal bill or mandate um, make you have an immunization or is that part of it? No, okay. That was one of my questions. And then the second question was, what if the people who are like, well, if you don't, you know, if you didn't like it, why didn't you just take them out or just take your, I know. That's the number one question we get. Take them out. On our Facebook group, we have a rule. Nobody's allowed to say take them out. No caregivers saying that, by the way. No, absolutely (laughs) not. I mean, listen, they're there for a reason. I mean, and, and that's part of the guilt of this. You know, I talk about for so many families that have lost their 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 family member, their loved one through a window, um, you know, yes. there's a lot of guilt that comes with that, and I call it complicated guilt because there are those questions: why, you know, why did I place them there? Why did I do that? Was that not the wrong thing for me to do? Why didn't I take them out? I should have taken them out. All of those questions, and for many of us, it was well, you know, this was temporary, you know this isn't going to last very long. So we're not going to take them out now and then not know it. I mean, it was a very difficult, I, I explain it as, you know, frustrating, heartbreaking, hopeless, helpless. I mean, all of those are the emotions that every caregiver faced in not knowing what the right thing to do was, you know, during that time, what am, what am I supposed to do here? And so what I've said is, I mean, I could have brought Steve home. There's no question, but my whole world would have, I I wouldn't have been able to work, you know, and, and he, that was even in those circumstances. I mean, again, those are the things that go through our mind to say, did I make a mistake? Um, And then when you lose someone uh, it's incredibly difficult to get over that grief. It's not just the normal grief that you would have. You have all these other feelings of guilt and even, it, I'll tell you, there was grief involved in just being separated from him, of that course. he was gone, that I couldn't get to him, but he was five miles away, you know, very, very different feeling of, um, of, of being separated and him not being a part of my life, yet the feeling of, I have to be fighting for him every day, I just can't sit here and not do anything and just wait for the government to tell me when it's okay for me to get back to him, what kind of damage is being done right here at this moment, And and, and what we see is one of the things that we're doing is we're producing books. We did one nationally. Uh, Mary Nichols did it in Texas. Mine for Florida is currently at the printer. It's called Saving Them to Death, The Impact of Isolation on Long-Term Care. And it's stories. You have to see the stories. You have to see the faces and hear what happened to people, the painful stories. If our legislators don't look into the faces of these people and see these stories, They'll never understand the need why we can never, ever let this happen again. We have to put these laws into place. This was absolutely barbaric what we did to them and how they were all alone by themselves in a room for weeks and months on end. Um, Absolutely. That's why we see a large number, a large increase in death certificates that have the cause of death is failure to thrive. Yeah. They gave up hope. And many of the, many of our, our, our followers say, you know, that she's saying, what did I do? Their mother was saying through the window, what did I do? Yeah. What did I do? Why am I being, you know, punished? Um, why am I in jail? You know, somebody needs to come in here and help me. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's been horrifying, the stories. And so we are putting those stories out there. We sent our book to every U.S. congressman and every U.S. senator uh, in the United States. We have a page of stories from every single um, state in, in the country you have to see the faces and hear the heartbreak of the stories that happened during this isolation to understand that we can never, ever let this happen again. Yes, agree. I love it. I love it all. Mary, you are a dynamo. You are, and I'm sure people are, you know, so if they want to get connected, they need to go to, to their state's page or they can go to the main page and then, and then follow their state's page just to be informed and to get the information. Um, and, and also to support each other so that you don't have this, the guilt and the, um, 
the grief, you know, the, the grief feelings and to have a place that you can go and, and the, the Facebook group has two was really devised for two reasons. One is a place of support where we can go and share our stories with other people who understand what we're going through. Okay. And the other one is advocacy so that you have a place to know what's happening in your own community so that you know what, what the rules are in your own community so that you can be sure that you are educated on those. So you can educate your facility on the proper rules and, and regulations so it's really that twofold place of support. And we have to do this. We have to advocate for our loved ones. And, and when we do, and I call it boldly advocating, a lot of people are afraid. They're afraid to raise their voice because they're afraid of retribution against their family members. They're mm -hmm. afraid that they're going to be punished. And we have seen places that have discharged um, residents simply because of the family members fighting the them. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we've had, we've had people actually say to family members, back off or we're going to discharge you. And obviously they can't do that, but they'll find a reason to do it. And you know, what I say is we are consumers, caregivers are consumers and we need to be smart consumers. I don't wanna do business with someone who doesn't want my family member as a resident there because I'm fighting to get to them. There's something yeah, wrong with that. Wrong here. Yes. Right? And so even with our facility, my facility, the, it's a Rose Castle is where my husband is. Um, they are actually pushing, and in fact, in our book in Florida, we have a letter that the preface is by the medical director from their company. It's 140 facilities across the Southeast, where he is telling the dangers of isolation and what they have seen clinically um, in all of these facilities as a result of this isolation. And so we want facilities like my facility is saying, we want the essential care designation. We want you all in here. We believe yeah. we can do it safely. That's the kind of company you want to do business with as a consumer. Sure. This company that's going to say, yes, we, we want you as our customer. And we want, listen, it, with the staffing issues that are happening in these facilities, they need us. They need extra hands and happy <laughs> residents um, and, you know, mentally healthy residents are going to be, you know, great it's for that. It's a lot easier. Yes, you know, it does. It really, really does. And we can partner together. And I'm doing a lot of work talking to facilities about partnering with us instead of fighting us on this as if we want to come in and do harm. We only want what's best for our loved one. And many of us are willing to help our facilities do whatever needs to be done to be sure that they're well taken care of. So if someone's listening, Mary, to this podcast and they're, they have a small facility or this and that, could they um, reach out to your group to figure out what, what, what your recommendations are and what, your, what you would recommend that they do? I would love that. And okay. I, and I do talk to places. I mean, so anywhere on the Facebook pages, whether it's the Florida, the Georgia caregivers for compromise, or just the national caregivers for compromise, you can always um, message me there. I'm in touch with really pretty much every single page. We have some pages that are pretty small um, in some States, but we have, we have quite a few that are incredibly active that are working very hard to educate their members. And it's all again, volunteers. So we're always looking for new people that are ready to jump in in their yeah. states and get busy. There is something that, there is satisfaction that comes with advocacy. Instead of sitting back and letting this happen to us, we are doing something. We are taking action to be sure that it doesn't happen again. And there is a bit of a, we talk a little bit, you know, about self-care. There is to me, that action is my self-care. Oh, Knowing action is the cure to wor any worry, any, it, you know, any tough feeling that you have about caregiving. Um, and frankly, you know, the storytelling that I provide through the podcast is a form of advocacy. I didn't see it as that at first, but I'm like, no, that it, that is. I mean, that is what wanted me to start the blog and start the podcast is like people need to understand that this is this is a lot. And and also to understand that, you know, self-care is not just facials and and getaways that there's got to be a way you know for the folks that are either have somebody in a facility or caring for somebody in their home or across the state or whatever and to be able to manage that day-to-day -day, um all that emotions the emotional roller coaster that we have how how do, how does that work for you mary how are you doing you know are you still working are you in seeing steve and advocating and where do you fit yourself into all of this I am my my company. I um, have sold my company, but I'm working two days a week um, and I'm doing advocacy the rest of the time. I'm doing a lot of speaking. I really enjoy getting out and speaking to groups and telling our story and how 
others can be impacted by that. By certainly, uh, again, my 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 story is really about empowering caregivers, mm-hmm. um, and so I'm I'm doing a lot of that. I see Steve every evening. I'm able to go in and put him um, to bed. And, and, and be with him until he drifts off to sleep every night now. Um, I, you know, I say often that caregiving for most of us, caregiving is temporary. Um, obviously in some cases with children, it may be a bit different, but for most of us caring for our parents or for me caring for my husband, it's temporary. Now, some people's temporary is longer than other yeah. people's temporary, but this too shall pass. And when it does, there comes a great power and a great satisfaction of knowing that you did everything in your power to take care of them when when somebody needed you the most. I have I'm I've been fortunate as I call it to have realized that feeling um, with my parents, with my grandmother, with you know other people in my family mm-hmm. and I recognize the value of when this is said and done to be able to hold my head up high, my shoulders back a little bit farther knowing that I did this for him, that I was there for him, like I promised him that I would be. That's life changing for me moving forward. That power that comes from that, knowing that I really did something that has value and that has worth to another human being makes me a better human being. And and I want I don't I I want to encourage people to look for that and to know that that is a gift to us. Um, at the end of all of this, we don't do it for that reason, but it is there for us when we're, when, when all of this is said and done, and it's a very powerful gift in, in leading a life that you can move through the grief and live a happy life. Um, not, not in spite of what's happened to you, but because of what's happened to you. Yeah. Was there a point in your journey, like, you know, with nine years of this, that you were, that you felt differently, um, that the, you, you know, have you experienced burnout? Have you, um, had to kind of reframe all of that? I'm a huge believer in um, support groups. I have been very active in, in dementia specific support groups um, throughout Steve's entire illness. I have a master's degree in mental health counseling. So I'm a real believer in talking and sharing what you're going through. I mean, in our group, you know, there's all, there's people behind me and there's people in front of me. So we're all able to understand where everybody is along the way. Um, so I'm a big believer in, in looking for people who understand, but you know, and, and everybody has moments. I mean, I'm, a, I, I'm also a believer that, you know, when you wanna cry, you need to cry. When you wanna laugh, you need to laugh and experience all the emotions that come with this. Um, embrace it instead of fighting it off. And, and again, that is whether that's, you know, just one night deciding I'm just going to cry all night because this is incredibly, and for me and Steve, it's just incredibly sad. It's just a really, really sad illness, disease to see yes. him wither away and to see him um, in a way that, I, that, that um, it's, it's just incredibly sad. And so I, I don't fight that sadness. I embrace that sadness and gives me motivation to go and be with him and to hold him and to hold his hand so that he's not alone in this, in this stage. Um, And so I try to use all of that as motivation to keep going and to keep being that person that I want to be for him, um, that I would want somebody to be for me. So it's not, it's, it's, it's very difficult, but it's not really that difficult. It's just, it's It's a mindset shift. It's right. Yeah. Right. And what a gift you are to your support group. Um, how, it, you know, I always like to ask, how did you how did you find the one that you connected with? This is um, the elder, um, the, the aging council in town um, okay. did it. And at, at one of the a memory care center, they do it. They have a, they have a day, daycare program there for Alzheimer's um, patients and which Steve was never a fan of. He was not interested in any of that. And um, but I found friends there. Um, and, um, it has been a huge benefit to me. We're also encouraging, I'm encouraging facilities to do, to do support groups, to, to bring in your family members. I think the core for facilities to actually bring in their family and make them, you know, we hear about family councils and that kind of thing, but make each other family, make each other feel like we're all in this together, that we're all looking out for each other together. I think there's great value in that, um, because I go in and I see other people, other family, other residents there who need something or who, you know, I have a, I raise um, puppies for an organization called Canines for Warriors. They do 
PTSD service dogs for for veterans with PTSD. And I have a golden doodle right now that yeah, is the yeah, most. Too. Not for He's the most popular dog in the place. So I have to make my rounds every day that we go. I bring him and make my rounds to all the residents because they all want to see him. And I want to take care of them. If I see that they have a need, if I see that they're, you know, I, I will take care of them because I know, um, I know their family and I know who they are. And, and so building that sense of community um, in these communities, I think is very important for families. I think so too. I think, you know, I don't know what their fear is maybe that they, people are going to talk about, um, but it's like, stop living in fear people. And um, what can happen? It's join forces and do this together. It's so much easier that way. Yes. And I'm not, and I, and I see a lot of, a lot of places who, who do, who do fight that, who don't, who are afraid, who are afraid that we're going to gang up on them or, you know, and, and we want this to be the best place you know, when I was talking about people who, um, as a consumer, you know, if I'm being threatened, if my husband, I feel like my husband is being threatened by the, I'm, I'm scared of the quality of care that he's going to receive. I'm going to move that person because and I, it's, it's going to be hard. I don't want to have to move this furniture. I don't want to have to. I had to do place. it for my mom for that you, exact reason. Yes. But you know what? You do what you have to do. And I'm not leaving my husband. I have told the group, I'm not leaving my husband somewhere where I believe that there's any chance that he's going to be mistreated because of my actions. It's cutting my nose off to spite my face, right? That I'm going to have to find a new place and I'm going to, and he's going to have to readjust and all those things but I'm just simply not going to do it. And if, if, if I feel that strongly about it, I want places to, instead of fighting us, instead of being against us, let's join forces and do this together. And it's going to be a much more satisfying experience for everybody. And I think your retention of staff will be better. I mean, I think there's so many pluses to it that if people will start recognizing it, we're, we're here to help. I love that. I, I, I believe it. Um, and I, I'm thinking about your golden doodle too. And I'm like, what a, what a poster child for your, um, the tagline of isolation kills as well, because we have a, a golden doodle. That's a mini golden doodle, a little over a year old. And, and I can tell you that she thrives with social interaction. So I'm sure your dog is, um, yeah, is the superstar and gets a, it's a mutual. Oh yeah. No, no, no. It's awesome. She'll get up into bed with us when, when we get to Steve's ah. room, just lay and he will sit there and pet her and pet her and pet her till, till, um, he drifts off to Love sleep. It. So it's really, it's really pretty cool. And, and the truth is she's here for me too. You know, I'm home by myself and I have, um, you know, have her, I had another dog. I had a, a chocolate lab during COVID during the original lockdown, which was invaluable to me to have, she was, she would be able to sense, um, that whole roller coaster of being separated yeah. from him. And it was incredibly valuable to me. So these dogs are, they're amazing. They're amazing. Sure. What's your doodle's name? Riggs. Rigatoni is, is uh, yeah, the we have a sunny, name. sunny sunshine. Um, S U N N Y. Yes. I love it. Um, well, talking about a little bit about um, uh, self-care, we're going to dive into the lightning round, I call it. So I have a book and I'm excited to to um, hear about your book, Mary. I want to um, definitely keep me looped in so I can help promote it for you. Okay. Um, just for you, the Daily Self-Care Journal. I wrote this with caregivers in mind because I didn't want them to think that self-care was some big thing that needed to happen and so this is a intentional way that you can just keep self-care top of mind um, for anyone that's looking to infuse more into their life um but actually before we dive into that since we are starting a new year i do something too that i will link to in the show notes called 22 for 2022 and these are all just fun things i love like, it um, I'm showing Mary, but for those of you who can't see, it's like, I want to get six massages this year. Um, I want to read 22 books. I want to try dim sum. I've never done that. Um, Dollywood is a place I've never been. Um, go to a winery, two college football games, a weekly restorative yoga session that I can do on my own. So is there something that you want to do for fun, Mary? On your, I love that idea. I'm going to do that. I love I'll, that idea. I'll send you that. Yeah, I'll send you the PDF so you can make yours. I would love uh, to do that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, well, I want to do that too. I want to do. I, I, I was just thinking. Um, I, I'd like to get a massage. I have like three gift cards from the last year for massages, and but doing it, you know, it's not out in front of me. And every time yep. I think about it, you know, I'm going out of town and to going to the football game this weekend, and so well, I'll get to it later instead of it in my, you know, sort of there being present in front of me in a in a guide yeah, like that. In a fun way to just to remind you, like, but, yes. I like uh, it. 
And there are so, like the place I have in mind is a walk in place. I can just go in and um, and and do do one there. But uh, so OK, so diving into the lightning round, it's just whatever okay. comes to mind. I picked out okay. some questions for you. Um, First one says, uh, since we're in the heat of, or not really the heat, the cold of winter, but we're in Florida too, the, uh, in Georgia, so we, we don't have it as worse as some, but which, what's your favorite thing about winter? Um, I get to wear sweaters in Florida. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, it can get awfully hot here. So I love walking the dog, taking the dog out for a nice long walk on, on, uh, uh with a little bit of a chill is a nice a crisper day. Yes. That is nice. Exactly. Yeah. Um, is there an unhealthy habit that you have successfully kicked or one that you're working on? Like for me, it was biting nails. I was, a nail biter um now recover recover and i find that i just have to keep my nails painted nicely with gel you know i don't um um you know for me it's it's what i'm trying to get better at is i mean not really a, a, a habit like that structuring my day mm. i need to have structure in my day to feel like i've accomplished something and sometimes with everything that's going on from different angles it's very easy for me to get distracted yeah. And at the end of the day, I don't get done the things that I want to get done. So I'm really working hard this year on being more structured so that I can feel yeah. that purpose every day and really get those things done that need to be done. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I tend I'm, I don't have great tips there because I tend to put too much on my list. I, but I um, have a planner, but I've heard about this like three, write three things down on a post-it to sometimes that works for people in the morning when you're having your cup of coffee. Um, if you could take a whole day off for just yourself, how would you spend it? Um, I, um, I think at the beach, I think just, uh, my family has a beach house, um, in Melbourne beach, um, nice. right down, you know, a couple hours down the road. I, I mentioned to you before that my, my grandfather graduated from Georgia law school in 1925 and he moved to Orlando and bought that house. Um, in 1935, and oh, wow. been my family since then, and there's just no place sitting on the porch of um, with our feet up on the railing and staring out into the ocean all day. Is there's just something restorative about that and peaceful about yeah. that that I love. Tie me up. That sounds yeah. great. Um, and I think you covered your it says what's a charity that's important to you and why. It might be the one of the ones you mentioned. Yeah, Canines for Warriors. Let me tell you a real quick story about yeah. Canines for Warriors. When I placed Steve, um, I had a, a chocolate lab before he, we did several dogs when he, you know, while he was still with me. And um, one of them was a chocolate lab by the name of Hero. And he went with the veteran. The veteran had some kind of training, something to do for his work. So he asked me if I would keep him for six weeks mm -hmm. while he was doing this training. So I got the dog and I got him the day after I placed Steve and in the in the long-term care center so when i first visited him for the first time it was about four days they had they told us to wait a few days let him get settled in and then i could come back and when i came back i had this chocolate lab with me mm -hmm. that he'd not seen for a long time and when he saw me the he he, he started bawling crying Aww. and i took him to we went to his room and he was crying i want to go home i want to go home and i'm sitting there thinking oh my god i'm gonna have to take him home I'm going to have to take this dog. I mean, this dog, I'm going to have to take Steve home and <laughs> the dog, he's sitting on the bed and the dog starts poking his nose into Steve's leg, poke, 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 poke. And I say, look at hero. And he starts petting hero and he starts looking at him. And I said, come on, let's take hero for a walk. And he stands up and he's very proud and he's telling him to sit and he's telling him and he's going around showing everybody. He never cried again. He's never asked to go home again. This dog took his service dog skills of, a, of, a, of Steve being upset, of Steve being stressed, of understanding that, and, and had him redirect. I mean, that poke, poke, poke of his leg was an intentional, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, concentrate on me, yeah. exactly as he was trained to do. And it worked unbelievably well. Again, he's never, ever cried again. He's never, ever asked me to take him home again. And so I called the founder of Canines for Warriors and I said, you're not going to, I mean, you're not going to believe this, that this dog that we trained, you know, two years ago has come back and helped us. 
I mean, it was unbelievable. And she, she told me, she said, you know, Mary, I've told you there's no coincidences when it comes to canines for warriors. And it was, it's certainly um, divine intervention that all of those things went into place. And I'll never forget it, that us doing, you know, helping to raise this dog for a veteran turned around and made a real difference in our lives and made that transition for him so much yes. easier. So it's pretty, it's pretty I love cool. that. I love the connection you have. But we'll link to the canines for warriors in the show okay. notes too, so people can have that. Um, and I think we've, we've talked about that. Um, where, where are you, like, what's your dominant emotion in your life right now? Like we've talked a lot about emotional, your emotional journey. Like what's, what's a dominant. I'm frustrated with politics. I'm frustrated with politicians right now. Yeah. I'm frustrated with, um, lobbying groups that are, um, that are trying to influence politicians, mm -hmm. um, to make decisions. I'm, I'm struggling with it in Florida right now. Um, I've got a group that says we don't need, is telling politicians we don't need an essential caregiver bill. And they're listening to them because- Why, they, why wouldn't we need that? I don't know. I don't know why, what the negative of that would be. So <laughs> them telling us they don't want anybody telling them what they have to do. I mean, yeah. that, that's super, super frustrating for me. That's why it's so important for people to see the faces of these individuals yeah. because you have, you have this company, you know, saying that, uh, you know, um, we don't think it's necessary. We just can educate everybody. Well, no, I mean, have you not seen what we've just been through over, you know, the last two year period, people do whatever they want. We just had a facility in New Smyrna beach that shut down over Thanksgiving, closed their doors, slammed the doors, no visitation for 14 days. Um, and put the residents in their rooms 24 seven, completely isolated in their rooms for an outbreak of scabies. Okay, never been done before anywhere. Yeah, now, now they think it's, yeah, now okay. They the power. Now they know they can do it, right? And so we complained and we got it opened back up, but why do we have to take on that burden? Why is that burden something else that the family members have to take on? Right. Instead of them understanding that you're not allowed to do that, don't do it. It's yeah. already hard enough. The job is already correct, and so that's enough. the frustration. Right now, I'm, I'm deep in the throes. The session in Florida starts next Wednesday, so I'm deep in the throes of trying to get through to politicians and get them to do the right thing, not what their not what the, the their biggest donors want them to yeah. do. And it's and it's by the way, it's everywhere across the board. This is not in any way identifying one political party over another. It's all of them. It's no, this is a human them. issue. This is not a political Correct. issue. That's exactly right. So yeah. that's, that's frustration right now is my biggest. Well, you might want to add to your 2022. I've been starting to do boxing again, um, but that will work out some of that. You know what? That's not a bad idea. In, in my basement. I just have, um, I have a Peloton bike and they have, they just started launching boxing classes. So you're punching, you know, the air, but it's still, it feels good. That's not a bad idea, yeah. right? That's <laughs> so how do people, I know you mentioned the groups, um, uh, Caregivers for Compromise, we'll link to that, but how do people connect with you, Mary? Where where do they, where do you hang out? I am on Instagram and Facebook. My um, handles for both of those are Mary S. Daniel. Um, I tell people there's no S on the end of Daniel, which happens all the time. The S goes in the middle. So it's gotcha. Mary S. Daniel and I'm on Instagram and I share a lot um of of not only some of my personal life like i'm going to this football game on saturday but um I'll, i really share a lot about this journey with steve and the the good and the bad and um and i i try to be very open i want people to know what this is like i want people to understand what this process is like and and hopefully with some awareness and and people knowing a little bit about it we can do some things um to make some changes like these laws and and that sort of thing to make life a little bit easier for the caregivers that are working so hard to care for their loved ones yes well we're cheering you on and um and looking forward to just continuing to support each other so thank you so much for sharing and being vulnerable and 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 making us smarter today mary my pleasure i i love to do it i appreciate it very much